Hello, everyone, and welcome to Booktrib Live, a Maramas Media production. Today, we are very excited to be chatting with nine-time number one New York Times best-selling author, Dr. Mark Hyman. Dr. Hyman has dedicated his career to tackling the root causes of chronic disease. In addition to being a practicing family physician, he is also an internationally recognized leader, a speaker, director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, and he is also the author of The Detox Box, Ultra Prevention, Ultra Metabolism, Hungry for Change. There's so many more I could just keep going on. Uh, but most recently, we want to talk about Eat Fat, Get Thin, Why the Fat We Eat is the Key to Sustained Weight Loss and Vibrant Health. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So to say you're qualified on this topic is just an understatement. Let's jump right into eat fat, get thin. Can you kind of explain the philosophy behind this and what you found in your study and research? Well, you know, I, I spent a lot of time looking at this issue of fat because so many people are confused about it. And most of us believe that actually eating fat makes you fat. But the fat that goes by your lips ends up on your hips because fat has more calories than carbs and protein. So weight loss is about calories in, calories out. And if you eat less and exercise more, you lose weight. But it's actually not how the body works because metabolism is not a math problem. So on the one hand, we believe that fat makes you fat. And on the other hand, we believe that fat causes heart attacks. So we were told to eat less fat, particularly a saturated fat, to reduce our risk of heart attacks. And both of these ideas, as we've understood the science in more depth, have been completely flipped upside down. So I felt it was important to sort of break through the confusion. There's also a lot of confusion about what should we eat and what oils and what fats and what's good and what's bad. And everybody was pretty confused. I mean, we're getting really conflicting advice from a lot of different places. If you listen to the news recently, you probably heard about this new study that showed that eating omega-6 fats actually killed more people, even though it lowered cholesterol. And the ones who had the lowest cholesterol by eating the corn oil, which is an omega-6 fat, had more heart attacks than the ones eating butter and saturated fat. So it completely contradicts our prevailing wisdom that the government is telling us that professional associations like the American Heart Association are telling us, which is to eat more omega-6 fats and less saturated fat. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So that was so, really why I dug into this, because I wanted to see what the research yeah, showed and yeah. communicate to everybody what the heck should we eat. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Has this in any way um, changed um, your thoughts? Like, have you always um, had this philosophy or... Um, has this just kind of enhanced your, your diet and health philosophy? I know. I, I actually <clears throat> went to medical school in the 80s when low fat was in, and everybody was telling everybody to eat low fat. And we had the food pyramid, which was essentially telling us to eat 6 to 11 servings of bread, rice, cereal, and pasta a day. I mean, can you imagine 11 servings of bread and cereal a day and pasta as a health strategy? That advice, and to eat fats and oils only sparingly, that advice has led to the worst epidemic of obesity and diabetes. And I actually always recommended my patients to eat low-fat diets to lose weight and to reverse heart disease. But in fact, uh, that wasn't working so well. <laughs> and since I've been having people eat more fat and less starch and sugar and refined carbs, they've had amazing results. I mean, people have gotten off 100 units of insulin, reversed their diabetes, lost 100 pounds. I never saw that when I was recommending low-fat diets. And there's, you know, there's more and more evidence. And it was a study published not too long ago where it was looking at 53 studies, randomized controlled trials, looking at low-fat compared to, to high-fat diets for weight loss. And the low-fat diets work better against the standard American diet, which is terrible. But compared to high-fat diets, they didn't do as well. And the high-fat diets always won out when it comes to weight loss. So high-fat in the face of low starch and sugar works better. Not when you eat your fat with starch and sugar, but... When you take out the starch and sugar and you add more of the good fats, your body responds by shifting your metabolism from fat storage to fat burning. And I go through the science in the book, which is that, that insulin is the fertilizer for your fat cells. Insulin is the fat storage hormone. And it's produced when you eat sugar or starch or any kind of flour products, rice, potatoes, pasta. Those things will drive up insulin and insulin then shoves all the fuel into your fat cell. It's like a opens the gates and your fat cells start to grow and grow and grow. That's why you get all this belly fat. So <clears throat> the key is really to eat foods that don't raise insulin. And the main food that doesn't raise insulin is fat. And when insulin's low, 
your body actually will respond by increasing the release of fat from your fat cells, by speeding up your metabolism, by cutting your hunger. And, and the opposite happens when you eat sugar and starch. When you raise insulin, you get hungrier, you slow your metabolism, <clears throat> and you stop burning fat, and you store more fat. It's the opposite of what you want to have happen when you're actually trying to lose weight. Right, exactly. What is it about this word fat that just it, it brings down such negative connotations? It bothers so many people. What is it that, like, that we have about that? Well, you know, I mean, the word fat has got a lot of negative connotations for sure. And, and we have both the fat we eat and the fat in our bodies, you know, both are seen as bad. And you know, we're cutting all the fat off the meat and eating low fat yogurt and low fat salad dressing. Uh, and the problem with that is that, uh, you know, we kind of confuse the two, right? Fat on our bodies and the word fat that we eat are the same word, but they shouldn't be, right? They really shouldn't be. And, and in many languages, and I've checked this out, many languages they're not. When you say someone's fat or overweight, it's a different word than saying eating the fat on your food. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so, so are there are, are there just are some there foods you should food stay away from, though, like from without a doubt, without or is everything in moderation just acceptable well here's a here's this problem we we have the philosophy of our government and the food industry being completely aligned and here's the messages they say it's all about personal responsibility basically it's your choice there's no good and bad foods there's no good and bad calories calories from soda and calories from broccoli are equivalent there's no such thing as as you know bad calories which means everything can be consumed in moderation and it's all about exercise. So these are the mantras, you know, personal responsibility, no good or bad calories, it's all moderation and exercise. This is actually a very big problem because it blames the victim for being overweight. Because if it's your fault, if personal responsibility means it's your fault if you are overweight, it misses the biology of how we actually gain weight, which we eat certain kinds of calories that make us hungry, slower metabolism, and actually drive weight gain. So if you eat sugar, or high fructose corn syrup, or flour, those are the big culprits. You know, some potatoes and rice, whole grains might not be as bad, but <clears throat> still, any kind of starch will raise insulin. When you eat foods like that in excess, they drive this cycle of weight gain, hunger, slow metabolism, fatigue. So basically, it's, it's these foods that make you overeat and tired. It's not being lazy and being hungry and, you know, being overeating that actually makes you fat. It's the opposite. It's actually being fat, having these hunger cells, these hungry fat cells that drive obesity. So that's really the problem. And, and, the, and the government message of the food industry and our professional associations are all making people feel bad for being overweight because they're going, just, just eat in moderation. Well, you really can't if you are struggling and your body is shifted to being carbohydrate intolerant. I talk about this in the book, Eat Fat, Get Thin. I talk about how do you know if you're carbohydrate intolerant? There are specific questions you get to ask that are in the book that tell you, you know, you probably shouldn't be having a lot of starch. Other people can tolerate more. And if you're carbohydrate intolerant, think of it as like a gluten allergy. You can't really eat much without triggering this high level of insulin response. And, and certain populations are more prone, like the Native Americans. You know, if they have a can of Coke, their insulin just goes through the roof, whereas mine might not, right? And then they have a very different need for, for different types of diets that are very low glycemic, higher in fiber, higher in good fats, and full of good quality uh, fruits and vegetables and protein, nuts and seeds. It's a very different diet. So there are good calories and bad calories. There's good fats and there's also bad fats. But there really is only kind of bad sugar and bad starch, unfortunately. Okay. And you can have it, in, you know, you can have it, but it's got to be like, I, I would say, you know, sugar and flour are recreational drugs. They're not staples. I mean, if you think of a, one can of tomato soup has more sugar than a can of coke people are shocked by that right it's everywhere yeah. so why would yeah. a can of tomato soup have more high fructose corn syrup than a can of soda because the food industry yeah. puts sugar in everything because one it addicts us to it, and two it it actually makes us hungry and eat more and three it makes it taste good so people will buy more of it mm. Mm. So what about the um, the kind of this organic um, epidemic is a bad word, but it's just taken over. Everyone wants organic everything. Is is that the right way to go? Are we look is is that the less 
high fructose corn syrup. Um, yeah. That was the area. Well, well there's the different. Right. So there's really there's really a difference between real food on the one hand and our processed industrial food on the other. That's the biggest right. distinction. Right. And then there's fine points. You know, is it grass fed meat or is it feedlot meat? Is it organic vegetables or non organic vegetables? I think honestly that matters less than switching from a processed diet to a whole foods diet. And honestly, I've seen dramatic changes in people who just start eating real food. It doesn't have to be organic. In a perfect world, yes, it would be all whole foods, organic, grass-fed, no pesticides, no hormones, no antibiotics, no food additives, absolutely. But you can go from eating a highly processed diet to eating a whole foods diet, even if it's not organic, and have dramatic health benefits. I did this with a family in South Carolina. They lost 200 pounds as a family of the, the, basically the mother, father, and the son who were massively overweight by simply doing the right thing and having foods that were whole foods. And I gave them a guide called Good Food on a Tight Budget. And, you know, we have this myth in America that if, if you want to eat healthy, it's expensive, it's difficult, it's time consuming, and it's only for the rich. That is just nonsense. We now know from good research that you can eat well for less, that you might not be having you know, grass-fed ribeye steaks for $70 a steak, but you can get cheaper cuts of meat, cheaper vegetables, cheaper nuts and seeds, and eat really good whole foods for less. And uh, there's a guide called Good Food on a Tight Budget, which I gave to this family who are on food stamps and disability. And they did this on food stamps and disability and switched from their processed diet to whole foods, and they had dramatic improvements in their health. So it's really accessible to anybody. It doesn't take that long. I'm very busy and I, I cook for myself and you know it doesn't take that long if you make simple foods. It's very easy, very quick. It's really, but it's a skill. Like if you don't know how to make something, it's gonna, it's been, like if someone said, like, I want you to build a house. I'm like, oh, I, I don't know how to build a house. I don't know how, where to start, where to get the wood, what kind of nails I need. I don't know how to run a saw. Like, right. But I can ask my friend who's like a carpenter. He's like, oh yeah, put, I'll put the house up in three months, I'll have your house. Like. You know, but if you need to cook, you need some basic skills. And thank God, cooking is not as hard as making a house. You just need to learn a few nice skills, how to chop and cut vegetables, how to shop, what to pick. There's a little bit of a learning curve, but once you get that, you don't have to make it complicated. It can be really easy and very effective. And um, you say you say dramatic results. What what is something? What should someone expect? They're trying to get healthy, and they're thinking, "Well, I'm getting healthy. I should be losing weight." But I mean, it's not going to happen overnight either. What are some results that that you would overnight? I mean, that's the beautiful thing when you when you take out the bad stuff and you put in the good stuff, the body responds. You know, we I've done this with the ten day detox diet. I did it with Eat Fat Get Thin. You know, we put people on a program where we remove all the foods that are processed foods, at real whole foods, good fats, a very low sugar, lots of phytonutrients, really low allergy foods, like very things that are, aren't going to trigger inflammation, which can be a problem, and in 10 days, we see people have, you know, lose seven, eight pounds. We see drops in blood pressure, 10 points, blood sugar, 20 points. We see drops in symptoms from all diseases by over 60%. So when you think about that, there's no drug that actually can reduce, you know, migraines, asthma, joint pain, you know, insomnia, digestive issues, reflux, irritable bowel, you name it. All those symptoms got better and diseases got better by taking out the bad stuff and putting in the good stuff. So the body has a huge chance to heal. And the beauty of this approach is not really a diet. It's a, a way of eating that creates health. So when I treat people, I'm like, I don't say lose weight. I don't say you need to go on a diet. I say, here's what your body needs to thrive and be healthy. Weight loss is a side effect. Getting rid of the diseases is a side effect of getting healthy. So eat fat get then it's all based on this model called functional medicine, which is this whole science that looks at the root causes of disease and helps people understand how to actually address the real drivers that are causing their weight issues, that are causing their symptoms. You know, you can lose weight lots of which ways, but the best way to lose weight is by understanding how to work with your body rather than against it. If you restrict your calories, you will lose weight for a little bit, then your body will accommodate. Because if you actually go on a calorie restriction diet, you lose a couple of pounds and then your body goes into alarm mode. It's like starvation. So what happens when you're starving? You slow your metabolism. You don't want to exercise. You want, you want to be still so you don't burn extra calories, you get super hungry, and you want to look for food everywhere. So that's like the worst thing you can do when you're trying to lose weight. What you want to do is shut off hunger, speed up your metabolism, and feel energetic and want to exercise. And that's what happens when you eat fat. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, so where where do you where, where where do play you in all of this? Play? I mean, for some people, some people. Where does what come into play? Genes. Um, oh, genes. Genes. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I always say if you want to fit into your genes, you have to fit into your genes. But uh, you know, genes play a role. They predispose you, but they're not a predestiny. And here's an example. <clears throat> you know, say, oh, I have diabetes in my family. Oh, I have heart disease in my family. Oh, my family's all overweight. You know, we inherit our habits more from our our, our parents than our genes in truth. And when you look at certain populations like the Pima Indians in Arizona, they actually, a hundred years ago, were very thin. They had no diabetes. They had no obesity. And now, a hundred years later, they are the fattest population in America. 80% have diabetes by the time they're 30. Their life expectancy is 46. So what happened? Did they all of a sudden mutate? No. They were very adapted to a very, very low sugar diet. And when they started eating the American processed diet, particularly white flour, white sugar, and what I call white fat, the white menace, which is Crisco and shortening, it actually drives so much of this insulin that they produce because they're used to living with scarcity. And all of a sudden they're having all this abundance and actually they start to gain weight. So the key is you have to understand your genetic risks. And yes, certain people are more carbohydrate intolerant, but it actually doesn't destine you to be stuck with that problem. You can actually fix it. And I've had patients who had diabetes and reverse it many, many times. We're at Cleveland Clinic now doing research to look at how do we reverse diabetes uh, using diet. Yeah. So let's talk about the Eat let's Fast about the Get eat Thin program fast. because you lay this out in the book. Um, what are some of the basics that someone who reads this book is going to get immediately out of it? Immediately out of it. Well, I think the key thing is, you know, the first part of the book, I explain how we got into this big fat mess. What was the perfect storm that got, why did we believe that low fat was good? And why did we believe that saturated fat was good? How did that, get, how do we get that wrong? And and, uh, and sadly, the data wasn't really very strong, and a lot of it was hidden. In fact, this new study that came out just last week showed that saturated fats may not be the boogeyman, and omega-6 fats, vegetables may not be the good guys, and they buried it for 40 years because they didn't want to publish it because it contradicted their point of view. So when I go through that, second I go through, what is the science of fat? What about saturated fats and vegetable oils and coconut oil and eggs and meat and I clear up all this confusion, go through the research and help people understand what the real issues are. And then I give people a very practical program. What are the good fat, the bad fats and the ugly fats and tell you exactly how to eat in a way to support your metabolism. I call it the pegan diet, which is you know very inclusive of most foods, but it, it sort of changes the amounts and changes what you eat. Because if you focus on what you eat, you don't have to worry about how much. If you eat the right foods, you, I mean, you, you can binge on a sheet cake, but you're not, you're not going to eat 12 avocados, right? So the body will naturally regulate when you eat the right food. Okay. So um, the recipes that you include, honestly, they're not typical and they're diverse. You cater to so many people's taste buds. So people's taste buds. How did you decide on some of the recipes? Well, I wanted food that was luscious, delicious, yummy, easy to make, fun. And also introduce some new things to people to get them to try things. So I think it's really important that we realize that this is not about deprivation. It's not about starvation. It's not about bad tasting food. It's about yummy, delicious, amazing food. And that's the best part of this. What makes food taste good? Fat makes food taste good. Unless you put sugar in, that's why the food companies put sugar in everything because they took out the fat and they had to put sugar in. And that's really unfortunate. I mean, think about it. Why would there be like a Coke's worth or more of sugar in a can of tomato soup. That's pretty bad. And when you when you add fat, you really don't need to worry about that. Yeah. So anyone yeah. Uh, can get oh, through a any, diet. I mean, for the most part, most people can and not really weigh it. Um, but what most people worry about is the after, is is the maintaining or the continuing to lose. What? How, how does this book help with that, with the follow through? Wow. Yeah, so so what I want people to know is that is that this isn't like a 21 day program and then you go back to eating you know donuts and French fries, right? This is about teaching you how you can feel. Most people don't know actually how good they can feel until they start feeling good again, right? They don't know how bad they were feeling, and they have the chance now to reset their system in 21 days 
to feel good, to have energy, to get rid of brain fog, to improve their digestion, to get rid of clear up skin issues, whatever is going on with them. And the weight loss is sort of a side effect. And then people want to continue to feel good. So they will keep usually using this approach and sort of expand it depending on what their needs are. And there's transition plans in the book to teach you how to transition to a lifelong way of healthy eating that's more flexible and variable. But you really want to take 21 days to give your body a reset. I mean, how many times in your life have you taken three weeks to sort of hit the reset button? It's like turning your body back to its original factory setting. It's very, very powerful. Absolutely. So can you explain, you touched on this for a minute, can you explain functional medicine a little bit more and why it's so important to you? Why it's so important. Sure. So I'm the uh, director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, and I'm also the chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. And functional medicine is a model of treating chronic disease that addresses the root causes. It sees the body as a dynamic system, not just a bunch of different symptoms. So, for example, if you come in, I had this woman come the other day, she had psoriatic arthritis, she had migraines, she had irritable bowel, she had reflux, she had depression, she was pre-diabetic, and she had itching and rashes everywhere. And, you know, she was seeing like a dozen different doctors for all these different problems, getting all these different drugs. And what I did was I fixed her gut. I got her on an allergy elimination diet, got rid of the bad bugs in her gut, put in good bugs, get, in, get her nutrients to help improve her system, vitamin D, fish oil, and gave her a really healthy diet, basically the Effect It Then program. And within two months, she came back. She was off all her medications and all of her symptoms were gone and she lost 20 pounds. So no more psoriasis, no more arthritis, no more migraines, no more irritable bowel, no more reflux, no more depression, no more prediabetes, no more insomnia, no more rashes, all that got better simply by eating the right foods and fixing the root cause, which was all these bad bugs in her gut and leaky gut and inflammation that created these problems throughout her body. And it wasn't just that she needed all these different drugs and different conditions. It wasn't like an accident that she had all these problems. So we see the connections between things. It's treating the whole organism, not just the organs. It's treating the system, not the symptoms, treating the cause. It's medicine by cause, not by symptoms. Yeah. So you were you were a medical contributor yeah. um, for places like the Today Show, Good Morning America, CNN, a ton. I mean, you, you've spoken on this topic a lot. What what was your goal each time you shared your thoughts on this? What did you want the public to take away most as you we were listening? To you? As you were. Yeah. Well, I think the most important thing that people need to know is that they actually don't have to feel bad. They people walk around what I call FLC syndrome, which is when you feel like crap. And that is something that is fixable by using food as medicine. Food is not just calories, it's information, it's instructions that everybody changes your biology. And when you eat the right foods, you can have powerful transformation of your body in a very short time. So I really encourage people to just take the leap, try this for a few weeks, see what happens. Your body will tell you what works. And I always say the smartest doctor in the room is your own body. Listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> when it tells you it doesn't like it, pay attention. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The topic of health and nutrition is honestly, it, it's such, there's so many vastly different opinions, as you even mentioned yourself earlier. Why is it there can be, that there can be so many diets and plans, philosophies, um, and what about eat fat, get thin, just makes the most sense? It makes the most, and most of that. Well, you know, I, Mark Twain said the problem with common sense is not so common. And the truth is, the truth is, if you look at all these different diets and all these different approaches, they all have a whole bunch of stuff in common. They actually have more in common than they have not in common. And that's where I kind of came up with this joke of the vegan diet, which is like paleo vegan, which is kind of like a parody of this whole, this kind of polarization. And when you look at the commonalities, they're like both saying, eat real food, get rid of all the processed junk, get rid of all the sugar and, and all the junk we're eating. We should be eating really low glycemic foods, meaning foods that don't raise our blood sugar. We should be eating whole foods, real foods. We should be eating ideally organic and sustainably raised foods. We should be eating good fats like nuts and seeds and avocados and coconut oil and some, you know, more, more differences around saturated fat, but, they're, but basically we should be eating good fats. We should eat lots of fruits and vegetables. We can eat nuts and seeds. We can have whole grains and beans. Uh, these are all common principles of almost everyone and the thing, there's areas of difference, like should you eat meat, should you not eat meat, should you eat eggs, should you not eat eggs. I address all these in the book, and I think there's there's good evidence that none of these foods are bad if they're whole foods, and that you can eat them as part of your diet. And the bulk of your diet by volume should be vegetables, 
And by calories, probably should be mostly fat, 50% or so fat. And it seems like a lot, but it's actually not that much. Because uh, if you're not eating that, what are you eating? You're eating starch and carbs. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, absolutely. Do you take into consideration the the mental processes that, that kind of go into overeating or into obesity? Um, and how, yeah, so there's a lot of things how, that... Yeah, there's a lot of things that go on, right, around your emotional response to food. So food is very emotional. It's social, cultural, it's emotional. There's a lot of issues for sure. But a lot of times people think it's emotional when it's actually biological. They think they're just emotional eating, but it's actually their hormones and their brain chemistry have been hijacked by sugar and processed foods. We know that sugar is addictive. We know that flour is addictive. We know that it triggers areas of the brain the same as cocaine or heroin. And that by doing a detox, which is essentially what the Eat Back Get Thin program or the 10 Day Detox Diet I did is, it's basically getting people off of that. And then they get to see, oh my God, it wasn't because I was just, you know, emotionally needing help or, you know, having some emotional issues around food. It was actually biological. And when I reset my brain, and by the way, fat is what most of your brain is made of. And fat helps your brain work better, helps deal with depression, anxiety, all sorts of stuff. So... I think if you eat the right fats, you literally can improve the quality of your brain. And you can deal with some of these emotional issues. And then you see what's left over. There may be, but often it's 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 not. Okay. okay. Some people may just be starting out on their path, on their journey to getting healthy. What would you say is the most important piece of advice that you could give um, to pass along to them? To pass along to them. I think, well, I think there's two things. One is that, you know, you have more power than you think to transform your health and your life in a very short time. So I would encourage you to take the leap and do an experiment for 10 days, 21 days, do something dramatic. And if you just do a little bit, it often doesn't actually work, right? Because if you're, let's say, hey, I'm just gonna cut out sugar, but you're eating you know, tons of bagels, it's just like eating sugar. So you might as well, you're not gonna see a benefit. So you really have to do a reset. So I would encourage people to do a reset, a powerful reset. Second is, I think people have to understand that they have the power to transform their health, and it's really not that hard. It just takes a few simple steps, a little bit of learning, and people can be empowered to really take back their health. And I encourage people to take back their health, take back their kitchens, take back their, their bodies from the, the body snatchers, which is the food industry. <laughs> yeah, and it can be really misleading, I think, for a lot of people, too, because they're thinking, well, it's out there, so it must be good, and yet, you know, you're saying it's bad, so what do I do? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, people, people uh, I think, are struggling. And I think uh, there's a lot of science behind this. There's like 500 references in my book. I've, I've done a lot of homework. And, you know, I, I, I do run a big institute at Cleveland Clinic, and we're, we're really looking at the science of all this. And the Center for Functional Medicine and the Institute, we've been training doctors for decades. This is not just a sort of fad. This is something that's really based on a lot of really good science that I've looked at. And, that we looked at collectively as a community. And it's, it's, it's really important for people to educate themselves about how their bodies really work. Definitely, definitely. Um, um, Mark, I can't thank you enough for being Mark, here. Mark, I can't thank you enough for being here. Please go pick it up, guys. Give it a read. Pick it's it up, fascinating. It's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Um, thank you again for being with us. I really appreciate thank your you time today. Us. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Everyone have a great day. Thanks so much. Everyone have a great day. Thanks so much.